Welcome back to Bovington. We're having a look at their Panzer 3L. Now the turret maintained the same general configuration for the production run of the Panzer III. It was going to have a three-man turret crew and it would have three hatches. The commander's cupola top and center and the gunner's and loader's hatches on the turret walls. They're all two-piece affairs, which means that they are nice and light to be able to open. Unfortunately, the two-piece also means that you have a shorter forward door, affording you slightly less protection if you're bailing out an enemy fire. You can see that there is an MG34 mounted to the front of the cupola here. It has to be kept off to one side to allow you to open and close the hatch. And this is also only suitable for ground targets. There simply isn't the elevation to shoot up into the sky. The cupola is a two-piece affair like the other doors. Very easy to open and close. Now you will notice that I'm rather exposed. The reason for this is that I'm standing on the commander's seat position, which is above a five centimeter ammunition bit. That doesn't adjust. So not seeing anything else upon which to stand, it would appear that if I want to ride around with my head out, I'm sitting on the edge of the cupola like, like this, or I'm at least standing on the seat and a lot of me is exposed. So not ideal there. That said, I'm now gonna hop into the tank and let's see what we got inside. The commander's position is quite reasonable. Um, he is a little bit constrained to the front by the recoil guard for the five centimeters. And he, I presume he has to keep his legs spread far enough that when the hot shell casings are ejected from the gun that they fall between his legs and not onto them. To help him, he has two footrests, very comfortably positioned, and you can stay here for quite a while. You have a little bit of lack of room for the shoulders to move, unfortunately, but that seems to be par for the course. Visibility, considering its time, is absolutely excellent. In fact, even by today's standards, it's pretty good. There are five very large vision blocks surrounding his cupola. You can't argue the point at all. Towards the left there is a connecting rod for the azimuth indicator. This is a small ring that you can see on the outside. It has a pointer to the front and thus it will always give the commander a reference point to where his hull is compared to the tank. Now that said, because I can see all of the entire interior of the tank, there is no basket in this tank. If he's ever confused as to which way his turret is facing compared to where his hull is, all he has to do is just glance down and he can see, oh look, I can see the radio operator to my front right, the tank is facing straight forward. There isn't anything else in here except for the firing port just below the connector for the intercom system. He does not control the radio, of course, that's forward. That's it. Next up, the gunner. Now, gunner's position is a little bit tight, but it's not bad. One of the things I've noticed that is really useful about the position of the commander back and center is that it frees up so much more room for the gunner. Because ordinarily, if you have the two in tandem, you only have the width of this turret ring to fit everybody. With the commander out of the way and somewhere else on the turret ring radius, this is fantastic. Uh, that said, it's still a little bit cramped in terms of length, Shorter people back then, okay, you could survive. The primary sight is the TZF-5E. It's an articulated sight and it's actually fairly complicated. It comes with three graduations to 1,200 meters for the machine gun, 1,500 meters for armor piercing, and about 3,000 meters for HE. And it comes complete with the mill triangles to help you estimate range as well. It's a fixed point of aim, so you set the range and then place point of aim on target, fire away. The primary toy course and the purpose for the L modification was the KWK-39 and L-60. Now, this would fire primarily the AP round, the Panzergrenade 39, and this would fire at about 850 meters per second and would punch through six centimeters or so of armor at 500 meters, which, well, wasn't bad, but you could do better. That would be the Panzergrenade 40, and that was an APCR round, higher velocity, 1,180 meters per second. Now, the advantage of this round was that you could punch through about 13 centimeters worth of armor at close range, say 100 meters. 
The problem is though that being a lighter round, the velocity drops off rapidly, much less so than the AP round, which was heavier and had more momentum. Thus, by 500 meters, you're down to maybe seven centimeters of armor, and at 600 meters, you're actually better off firing the older AP round. Range of traverse for the gun, plus 20, minus 10, done by use of a manual control handle here. Uh, there is a bolt holding it in place, unfortunately. And now that I've released the turret lock off camera, uh, the turret traverse is very quick, actually. It's about 2.2 degrees per turn. As you see, just one turn, away you go. There is a two gear option, so for fine tuning, uh, there is a gear shift and you go at half speed. Other features, to my direct front, I am very pleased by the vision, which was a bit risky because frankly, it's a great big huge block of glass, obviously bulletproof, uh, about maybe 12 centimeters wide by 15 high through which it is apparently one could mount an auxiliary sight or you could leave it off and you just got a good, wonderful field of unity view to your front. Makes a nice change. Turret lock is located front and to his left and he has an azimuth indicator right off of his left shoulder here. There was a possibility of uh, opening up this little latch here which is unfortunately frozen in place and perhaps adding a periscopic sight. Front, you can see the torsion bar system which was used for gun balance. As the Vorpanzer was added, there would be additional springs added to the torsion bar system just to keep the gun easy to elevate and depress. That's pretty much it for the gunner seat. As I say, it's a little bit tight. I mean, my, my shoulder is against the turret ring, my right shoulder is against the recoil guard. The platform could do with maybe being an inch or two lower. But otherwise, this is a very well laid out, especially for the time, gunner seat and there's really nothing to complain about at all. For the loader's position, well, he's got no seat for starters and there's no turret floor. That's not too bad as the floor isn't all that cluttered except for the very, very large housing for the prop shaft which goes all the way from the back of the tank to the front. He's got to be careful to step over it as the turret traverses. The ammunition is stowed in bins around the tank, stowed vertically. There is 84 rounds carried, generally spit about 50 AP, 34 HE. Outside of that, it is nice that he has his own door, which is a little bit rare for loaders. As you can see, it is left-handed loading. Grab the ammunition out of the ready rack here, which is actually pretty reasonably located. The door simply slides open, grab the round, bring it up, and then into the breech to his right as he's facing to the rear. So if you want to get rid of some of your empty shell casings that are cluttering around the inside now, and of course you don't want to open up the doors in combat and there's no room to get a past the commander, in the whole floor, they've inserted a hatch. So lift up the immediate floor, remove the safety, pull up the main floor hatch, and you just jettison your shell casings down there. Now, of course, it wasn't just shell casings that will go out the bottom of this hatch. This was also very obviously used for various bodily functions as well. There's the handle for the radio antenna, which could be elevated from the inside. All right. And down underneath is one of the ammunition bins. The ammunition is stowed vertically behind these sliding doors. The escape hatch is located behind these boxes here. Now, there are quick release pins but even after having removed them, I can't get, seem to get this frame out of the way to access the escape hatch. Fortunately, the one on the other side is a little bit easier to get to. With the deletion of the viewports on the left-hand side, the only thing he has left is the viewports which aim a little bit back into the right in the door walls, and that doesn't really help very much in combat. However, uh, there are fewer weak points, I guess, if you do it that way. So next, I'm gonna go forward into the hull, and you'll note that the only way into the driver's compartment is through the turret. This is cozy.
So now that I've actually made it in, which is a rather inconvenient process because you would like to have your own hatch if at all possible, uh, and then raised my seat back up, this is very, very good, especially compared to some of the other 1939, 1940 tanks that I've been in. I mean, nothing but bad things to say about the French driver's positions. This is luxury in comparison. Controls are simple enough. You have two steering tillers. They are on a clutch brake system. So they pull back the first uh, section and that releases the clutch pressure, continue to pull back and you start applying the brake to turn. There are three pedals. The clutch pedal is in the traditional position. The accelerator pedal is in the traditional position. Up top and center from the top instead of from the bottom is the brake. Gear shift is on the right hand side as you would expect it to be. And it's a H pattern, first, second, third, fourth. You depress the button on the top to go all the way to the right to go into fifth or sixth. To go into reverse, there's a little latch you have to push down then that will allow you to move the gear stick to the left and then forward into reverse. Big handle up here is for extra clutch strength. So if you're particularly heavy going, shove the handle all the way forward. It applies more bite to the clutch. Nice idea. Now to see out, he's got a rather large unity block here. It is direct vision and you'd better hope that the uh, Perspex stops any incoming fire. Now obviously it's not going to stop high velocity large caliber rounds, at least large caliber for the time. So what you would do is you could lower the visor at the front and then slide over this periscopic sight. It's been kind of locked in place unfortunately. This here covers two little ports uh, that line up with the periscope here. So as you're driving then with just the two little periscopic holes, it's a lot safer. And of course at the left hand side, he does have another visor there. Right hand side consists of your standard, typical uh, dashboard. You've got the rev counter, you've got uh, pressure, you've got uh, old fashioned fuses on the right. No particular fascinations there. Just to the right, you have the transmission housing itself running from the prop shaft to the rear all the way through. You can see also that the steering mechanism has been shrouded. They put a protective screen here, but otherwise it is pretty open to the steering transmission differential system. I do like the additional cushion at the top there to stop you from bashing your head. Uh, if it wasn't for the fact that you don't have a hatch of your own, this would almost be a perfect driver's position. And for those people that say that you can never have a comfortable driver's position for a person my height, especially in early war, this is a case in point. Uh, this is the way the driver's position sh should be. So combine that with the room in the turret because the commander has been moved out of the way. Ergonomically, this is a very good tank. One thing that has confused us a little bit is this little Yoki here, which will adjust and can be selected by use of a toggle switch on the right here. My guess is that this is a timer, uh, given it goes from one to 12, and you would use it for navigation, especially in the desert, for example, where there are no navigational features. You go a certain direction for a certain amount of time, yeah, know where you are. Now, frankly, I don't know why you wouldn't just use the odometer on the right-hand side, that's what we normally use, uh, but it's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head. I'm sure somebody with access to the manual will make a comment on the bottom, but so far, the, uh, neither myself nor the staff who actually drives this vehicle, he's the guy who's been assigned to keep an eye on us today, uh, knows what this is for. On the opposite side from the driver, I'm not gonna get into it, is the radio operator. And you can see he's got very good access to the radios which are angled slightly inward. To his front on a spring balance is the Bow MG34. Ammunition in the tray to his front. No pedals, he's got lots of room. Again, the only real problem with that position is the lack of an escape hatch. So were I to do the, oh my God, the tank is on fire test, I'm afraid to say that from the hold positions, not so much. Still, I guess you have to have some flaws with the tank and otherwise, from the tour here, I've been very impressed. 
All in all, about 1,470 Panzer III L's were manufactured, and that includes the late model J's, which had the long 5 centimeter. they were simply redesignated as L's, although they never changed the builder's plate. The last two modifications to the vehicle were the M, which was an L with fording ability, and the N, which would see the 5 centimeter gun replaced by the 7.5 short cannon as found on the Panzer IVs, which were now receiving the longer gun. As tanks became bigger, eventually the room to upgrade the three reached its limit, and from then on production would focus pretty much on the Panzer IV as the general purpose tank. In the end, somewhere around 6,000 Panzer III's were built, including about 350 command tanks. Overall, you would argue that the Panzer III was quite reasonably the best tank in the world at the beginning of World War II, because it was reasonably capable, quite reliable, but most importantly, had a very good balance of crew ergonomics and the ability of the crew to get the vehicle to its maximum potential. Add to that a reasonable gun, good upgrade capability for the time, good upgrade capability in terms of the armor, and you can see why the Panzer III has been perhaps under-regarded as a tank in history, being overshadowed by more technologically capable later tanks. Hope you enjoyed the tour of the Panzer 3L here in Bobbington. I'm Nicholas Moore in the Chieftain. Hope you enjoyed it. See you on the next one.